Kurze. Good evening all in real and virtual worlds and on cable access and YouTube. And welcome to our Christmas holiday edition of the Flint Creative Alliance. That's what you call yourselves, right? Flint Creative Alliance's Creative Collab Night, hosted graciously by the wonderful Good Beans Cafe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And Mr. James Blue. Yes, I am your, your, your deputy host, as it were. I'm James Blum. And any announcements or anything anyone would like to make, let me know. You can make them, I'll make them for you, whatever you like. It is collab night, so let's collaborate, shall we? I have with me not only my radiant presence, but also my alto clarinet and my mandolin, if you would wish me to accompany you. The alto clarinet is a nice spooky stick. It makes for a good beatnik accompaniment to, to poetry readings. And uh, there it is, so let's do all that. And we shall begin tonight with the Hudson Bay Company adorned Flint's most eminent local historian, Mr. Gary Flynn. And movie star, I might add. Uh, yes. And now that it's winter, I'm back wearing Joseph's coat. Yeah. So uh, in case someone wants to talk back on a video like uh, what's now in the Flint Underground channel, I think it was Nick complaining about my not wearing a coat during one presentation. Well, it was hot that night. So who wants to wear a wool coat when it's hot? Yeah. Yeah. I might. It's really yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's a great way to, to dehydrate. Yes. Of course, uh, six years ago, uh, I wrote a book, Remembering Flint, Michigan, Stories from the Vehicle City. Uh, which is available at local bookstores, my back seat of my car, for $19.99 for the cover Ooh, price. $19.99! <laughs> and early next year, I will have another book out called Hidden History of Flint. What I have right now, as soon as I put this aside, is the manuscript. I'm going to read from that manuscript regarding um, a bank which is undergoing some changes. As you probably know, some First Merit Bank branches are getting new signs. Uh, they'll be shrouded temporarily with uh, First Merit Bank signs, uh, and I'll mention what it's going to be come uh, after the President's Day uh, weekend in February. So here's the chapter from the next book, which hopefully, uh, depending upon what the editors do, here's what I call it, the history of National Bank of Flint, scratch, Michigan National Bank, scratch. Standard Federal Bank, scratch. LaSalle Bank, scratch. Bank of America, scratch. Huntington National Bank. On Friday, September 12, 2014, the Flint Area Branch offices of the Bank of America closed permanently at 12 noon. The following Monday on September 15th, the branch was reopened as the Huntington National Bank. Huntington was founded in 1866 in Columbus, Ohio by P.W. Huntington. Huntington's splint operations go back to the depths of the 1930s Great Depression. The National Bank of Flint was founded on January 30, 1934, to free up the impounded deposits of two failed banks, which did not reopen after the 1933 bank holiday, Union Industrial Bank and First National Bank of Flint. The following day, National Bank of Flint opened its doors at 9 a.m. in the former Union Industrial Bank building, which is today the Mount Foundation building which housed the descendant local banks up to Bank of America. The president of National Bank of Flint was Robert T. Longway. The wartime economy after the 1941 Pearl Harbor attack had the National Bank of Flint concerned about the possible impact of wartime restrictions on Flint's auto industry, so they expressed interest in a buyout offer from Lansing-based Michigan National Bank. Michigan National Bank was founded on December 31, 1940 by banking official Howard W. Stoddard who orchestrated the merger of banks in Lansing, Grand Rapids, Port Huron, Battle Creek, Saginaw, and Marshall to create the new bank. Stoddard had served as the federal official for the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in Michigan to provide help to failing banks during the Great Depression. Stoddard was familiar with the National Bank of Flint as he helped to organize it. The directors of the National Bank of Flint voted to dissolve the bank on March 12, 1942, and sell its assets to Michigan National. A former Flint Trust Company official who had moved to Boston, Fred Lavery, returned to Flint to become Michigan National Senior Vice President in charge of the Flint branch. 
Local advertisement from Michigan National Bank made it clear that control of the bank and the issuing of loans would remain in the hands of Flint bank officials. The World War II boom made the Flint branch of Michigan National Bank very profitable. At that time, Michigan had very tough banking laws. Banks could only establish branch offices within a 25 mile radius. As Michigan National is based in Lansing, it could only establish additional branches in the Lansing area. That forced the Flint office of Michigan National Bank to operate only in its downtown location in the Mount Foundation building. In 1962, Michigan National opened a drive through office downtown at the corner of 1st and Beach Street, now a Chase drive through branch. Michigan National got around the branch office restriction for Flint by connecting the drive through office with the main office of the Mount Foundation building via a pneumatic tube buried underground. In 1966, a new three-story addition for Michigan National's Flint branch was built adjacent to the Mouth Foundation building at the former site of the Strand Theater. Today, it's the Commerce Center building. When legislation was enacted in Michigan to allow for bank holding companies in 1972, Michigan National Bank formed Michigan National Corporation as the bank holding company, which could establish separate banks within the 25-mile radius. The bank Michigan National Corporation established for the Flint area was named Michigan National Bank, Mid-Michigan which opened its first office on Miller and Linden Roads in 1973 and eventually took over the downtown location. Losses, which Michigan National suffered in the early 1980s due to the bank holding company's exposure to two major bank failures, led to the shedding of half of Michigan National's 700 ATMs and the closing of 140 of its 340 branches, including half of Michigan National Bank mid Michigan's 20 area branches. The holding company was, was a struggle to remain independent in the midst of setbacks in banking deregulation. One such deregulation in 1988 allowed for statewide branch banking and allowed Michigan National Corporation to consolidate all of its affiliate banks into one bank called Michigan National Bank. In 1995, Michigan National Bank was sold to Australia National Bank. In 2000, Australia National Bank sold Michigan National Corporation to the Dutch financial institution ABN AMRO. ABN Ambro already owned the Michigan-based financial institution, Standard Federal Bank. On October 9, 2001, Mich uh, ABN Ambro merged Standard Federal Bank, which was founded in Detroit in 1893, with Michigan National Bank. The combined bank adopted Michigan National's National Bank Charter, so the name of the merged bank became Standard Federal Bank N.A. for National Association. ABN Ambro's American subsidiary was LaSalle Bank Corporation, which also owned Chicago-based LaSalle Bank N.A. On September 12, 2005, Standard Federal Bank N.A. changed its name to LaSalle Bank Midwest N.A. in what was called a brand consolidation instead of a merger in order to combine marketing resources. In 2007, ABN AMRO agreed to be taken over by a consortium of three European banks. In a side deal, LaSalle Bank Corporation was sold by ABN AMRO to Bank America based in Charlotte, North Carolina. On October 1, 2007, Bank of America officially took over, La took over LaSalle. Over the following few months, sign companies, including Earl Dobb signs locally, replaced La LaSalle Bank signs with Bank of America signs, which were shrouded with LaSalle Bank temporary canvas signs. On the weekend before Monday, May 5th, the LaSalle shards were removed to reveal the Net Bank of America logo. LaSalle signs, which were not replaced in time, such as at the Mouth Foundation Building downtown, were covered with Bank of America canvas signs. The immediate effect of Bank America's October takeover of LaSalle was access to all Bank America and LaSalle ATMs by Bank America and LaSalle Bank ATM cardholders, as well as the ability of LaSalle ATM cardholders to access ATMs worldwide, fee free of banks which are members of the Global ATM Alliance, which Bank America is part of, as is Scotiabank in Canada. Being a trillion dollar mega bank, Bank America became the target of critics who believed the bank is too big and abusive. Members of the Occupy Flint movement picketed at the Bank of America downtown office in the Mount Foundation building in 2011. The downtown location closed in 2013 due to declining business. Uh, on May 11, 2014, Huntington Holding Company, Huntington Bank Shares Inc., bought from Bank of America its operations in the Flint, Monroe, Holland, and Muskegon areas. The month before, Huntington bought Bank of America branches in the Saginaw, Alma, and Port Huron areas. Huntington has started in 2013 establishing offices inside Meyer stores, including stores in the Flint area. The sale saved the branch on Ballinger Highway as it was later to be closed by Bank America, but Huntington wants to, uh, wanted that branch to stay open. Lucky me, that's my handy bank. 
but, but I was digressing. The sale, um, uh, the sale also included most deposits at the bank, but not the outstanding loans which stayed with Bank of America. The old Dolph signs returned to change the signs from Bank of America to Huntington. This writer's checking account was not included due to its ties with an investment account with co-owned Merrill Lynch. I was able to transfer the checking account to Huntington. In late August, new Huntington signs were erected to shroud a temporary covers of Bank of America name. As mentioned, the conversions took place the weekend before Bank of America branches before the former Bank of America branches in the Flint area reopened as Huntington branches on Monday, September 15, 2014. Because credit card accounts were also not transferred, this writer was able to apply for a Huntington credit card online and began using that card on September 1st. After all the Bank of America credit card transactions went through, I cashed in the bonus points, paid off the Bank of America credit card bill at a branch, and closed the credit card account with the help of the Bank of America branch officers who were retained by Huntington. Afterwards, the old card was shredded. The new Huntington ATM card arrived Thursday after the changeover. The welcome to Huntington instruction package without new checks arrived in the mail the following day. The Huntington checks finally arrived the following Wednesday. The next day, I had an appointment with the Huntington investment specialist to arrange transferring the investments from Merrill Lynch to Huntington Investment Company. In January 2016, Columbus, Ohio-based Huntington Bank shares bought Akron, Ohio-based First Maricourt for $3.4 billion. Nearly four years beforehand, First Merit had bought and sold Citizens Republic Bank Corp, parent of Citizens Bank, whose downtown Flint headquarters is topped off by the landmark weather ball. After First Merit absorbed Citizens, the original CB neon letters were replaced by FM letters and First Merit's diamond-shaped logo. Huntington completed this acquisition of First Merit on August 2016. This led to Huntington fielding questions on the status of the weather ball. Huntington assured Flint residents that the weather ball would be retained and would be refaced in new letters. In November, Huntington began makeovers of First Merit branches and replacing signs which would be shrouded with, with temporary First Merit sign. Conversion of First Merit branches into Huntington branches would, would take place in, 20, in February of 2017. And um, also, I did see a uh, courtesy of Bill Carr signs, uh, the changeover of signs from uh, First Merit to Huntington, but again covered with uh, temporary canvas covers the First Merit Bank in Flushing. And that takes care of this month's presentation. Uh, watch my new book coming out early next year, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. And now, this is called the Creative Collaborative Canvas, is it not? Yes. Yes, it is. So, I would like to thank Jenny for beginning the Creative Collaborative Canvas okay. with a portrait of me. Well, it's actually Polly. I believe Polly painted that. Oh, bit. Polly, I okay, apologize. Polly, thank you for the, the portrait yeah. of me. Yeah. It is, really. Well, well, yes, it's, a, it's a, a curious picture, coincidence, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's like me in a mirror. Uh, at any rate, um, next up, we have local songster guitarist, singer, volleyballist extraordinaire, and still Mike Knight host? Yes, yes. Yes, at the lunch studio on a Thursday, first Thursday? First Thursday. First Thursday of the month, downtown Flint, the lunch studio. Your host is none other than the following gentleman, Mr. Brian Pobok. Is that correct? Pobosik. Pobosik, I missed the I. And here to think I fancy myself a Slavicist. Pobosik, yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, my typical not being overly prepared, I'm gonna do two Christmas songs, neither of which I wrote. Um, okay. Okay, this is a song that was, uh, if you're familiar with it at all, you're probably, well, there's two ways you could be familiar with it. One is through uh, mid 60s, early, 60s, uh, Brooke Benton, and uh, I guess it was touched up a little bit in, just a few years ago in the Netherlands. Oh, that fell, by the way. And the Netherlands, uh, a female singer did a duet with him with his recording, and it was a big popular hit. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
it. Yes. Working on that. Somebody needs to lube the stand in the part of the expression. Mm -hmm. That's the second time I've heard that phrase used <laughs> <done> today. <laughs> Lubing the stand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was meant to be. I, I think it's a quite common uh, I thought it was common. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's if increasingly I, uh, popular in the vernacular. If I hear it again, I'll, if we hear that right. phrase again, we all scream out at the, at the top of our lungs. Hat trick. Okay. <laughs> I wanted added to Wikipedia. <laughs> All right, here we go. Merry Christmas, everybody. I want my arms around you for Christmas. I need no presents under the tree. and Christmas songs. Um, this is my 30th year working retail. Yeah, retail. And so I've been exposed for 30 years, a good month and a half out of the year. I've tried to do the math on this. It's oh, over three and a half years of my life just in retail to, to a nonstop loop of Christmas songs. And so I think, we, I think people who work retail might have fantasies about um, gaining control of the, the, the loop. <laughs> and uh, uh, so as far as Christmas songs go, neither of these two songs, I've, uh, the first song I've played and this song that I'm going to play, I've ever heard performed over the loop. And if they ever gave me control, especially during Christmas, of the loop, I would be sure to put Christmas songs in there. But I have a feeling a good two songs in, they'll decide, ah, this was not a good idea. Um, and they'd go back to their conventional um, list of songs. Uh, we're going to give this one a try. This is a different tone. This is from the mid-70s. It's a songwriter that I've admired. And I don't know if I've ever performed one of his songs here. I might have. I don't think it's ever made it on video. But it's an unconventional song, it puts me in mind of, what it brings to mind, you know, in my own home life is uh, growing up, big family, my grandmother having Christmas, and then, you know, the aunts and uncles, they move away, and then the holidays get kind of smaller and shorter, and eventually everybody moves away, and grandma happened to have 
not one, but two adults that remained in her household for many years, and they were dysfunctional uncles, okay? And so uh, people really, it became kind of um, uncomfortable to spend a lot of time in Grandma's home with these two nitwits. And they, they, one of them, one of them is deceased, and the other one, whoever, whatever. Anyway, um, so my my uncle Denny, who is deceased, um, I recall one Christmas in particular when the, nobody else, there was no get-togethers any longer. Anyway, he came barging into the house Christmas Day. He was all, uh, we'll say, pissy, and uh, he was really in a bad mood, and didn't, you know. He had just gotten arrested for uh, public urination, oh. so he spent Christmas in jail. <laughs> well, this song is not, you're very close, Gary, to the title of this song. It's not Christmas in Jail. This one's called Christmas in Prison. <laughs> it was Christmas in prison, and the food was real good. We had turkey and pistols carved out of wood and I dream of her always even when I don't dream her name's on my tongue and her blood's in my stream wait a while eternity oh mother nature's got nothing on me come to me run to me come to me now we're rolling my sweetheart we're flowing by God. She reminds me of a chess game with someone I admire or a picnic in the rain after a prairie fire. And her heart is as big as this whole goddamn jail and she's sweeter in the big yard swings around with a gun and spotlights the snowflakes like dust in the sun it's christmas in prison there'll be music tonight i'll probably get lonesome i love you good night wait a while eternity oh mother nature's got nothing on me come to me run to me come to me It's John Prine. Good job, James. Oh, all I did was stand here. All righty then. Thank you again, Brian. Um, performers, be aware, and other stage creatures, that these steps require your careful treading. Um, this is especially a reminder to myself, as many, many, uh, uh, well, a great deal of physical comedy has resulted in me in those, those movable steps. And now, we have a young poet to whom uh, Rainer Maria Rilke did not write letters. It is none other than Chesning, Michigan's own Demeter Blum. I have been writing a lot since I was little. I don't know. Um, I've only found the stuff I've written to be like halfway decent for like the past couple of years. But that's assuming that anyone else finds it, and I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. <clears throat> I, 
and there's no title because I don't know. I don't title because I can't because I... anyway, I'm gonna shut up. No, I'm not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me your stories, you whispered to me. Tell me the truth, told in a thousand lies. Sound echoes off these pale gray walls, bare and unforgiving in this fluorescent light. A radio, a radio of static status hums with the saddest songs ever sung hiding deep within the white noise. Every time I look at you, I see the unspoken word, and I hope you understand. I tell you of road trips and sunlight days and the, day, and the way I felt lying beneath the moon, filled with wonder and uncertainty. That sallow lady shone on me as if she knew. She knew I needed silent support. Her inconstant gaze felt relatable and true. You understood. I spared the martyrs from their fates. I asked you if you thought the message was the same, retold. No liars left to play their tune. No one cared enough to repair them. The former deities that the liars left and abandoned. The golden idols cracked. It was plating all along. Beneath, they are soldered to wood. Wooden solder soldiers salute you. Carbon copies and matchbox cars and cookie-cutter homesteads. The ex-gods forlorn upon the lonely altar. The false idioms we all forgot. For worship, if it done at all, is to the dollar sign on high, a commodity few can afford. One percent has time to pay tribute to the Almighty. Time is money, after all. The rabble scratch and scar, searching for a dollar to pay for their pills. Their precious time spent withering behind desks. The otherworldly presence is ignored. Their prescription dulls the senses. With no harm meant in your words, you say the intricacies and trivialities seem so much more when said in a false whisper, a quiet lie. And I agreed. No harmony, no foul, because the beat, the melody of the tale I spin and spit from cracked lips hides behind simple ideals I barely understand. But I voice my opinion anyway. I speak because I feel strongly about thing X, Y, Z, but this, this isn't just some casual affair. This means so much more. I tell you these stories on the promise that one day you will admit the truth. You agreed. Our time spent together wandering the universe, lying about on that living room floor, our words transporting us to other worlds, was it worth a thousand of their Bahama beach days, a counterpart I can count on. Platonic is the only way to describe it, but we both wish it weren't so. Plato would be proud of you and I, defining and divining meaning from the lies and the lies from the truth. Tell me your stories, you whispered to me. Tell me the truth, told in a thousand lies. I'm not sure if you believe me, but you believe in me, and that's exactly enough for this to work. I like her. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, once again, a reminder to everyone. Yeah, Dad, yes, you must sign up to perform just like Demeter did, and did a fabulous job. Yes, so one more time, I know this is nepotistic of me. Actually, it's filiistic, I suppose, of me. But uh, once more for Demeter Blum, anyone? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, and now, the staple. Yes? What's filiistic? I like words and I don't know. Oh, uh, well, nepotistic, ne Nepos is nephew, and Philius is son. Oh, okay. Or daughter, Philia is, is daughter. So. <laughs> that, that, yeah, uh, well, that's philia with a ph, this is, that's Greek, this is philius with an f, that's Latin. Oh, okay. So, um, anywho, yes, next up is the very staple, the, 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 the rock upon which the collab night is built, other than Mr. Lee Baliad. Yeah. <laughs> well, what a nice family James has here, and James and his wife. He had been telling me in the past, man, these, these kids are killing me, man. They're at they're, they're work, but as I see them tonight, really well behaved. You must have put the fear into them, huh? No, no fear. Okay. <laughs> fear doesn't work. All right, you tried that, huh? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Well, good evening. My name is Lee. Hello, Lee. Hi. I brought some, uh, a few Christmas songs because it is that time of the year. As Archie Bunker used to say on his show, 
the Christmas season has us by the throat. <laughs> I try not to take that approach, but he might not have been too far off. So anyway, I'm going to start out with something uh, that's not Christmas, the first song. You bring my ends all the way up, so whatever you want to do there. Okay. Let's set this up a little bit. It's called Steal Away, and it was one of the first songs to, to come out of uh, Muscle Shoals, Alabama. For those of you that have followed any, any of the uh, rhythm and blues, and even, well, mostly rhythm and blues, but it's uh, Otis Redding, uh, Rod Stewart, Aretha, all these people made some really terrific albums down in uh, Muscle Shoals, Alabama with the help of uh, Rick Hall, the producer. And this was the first song to come out of there that had any success. It was done by uh, Jimmy Hughes. Called Steal Away. I've got to see you. Somehow, that's my drum. Not tomorrow, but right now. I know it's late, but I can't wait. Come on and steal away. Now don't start thinking, trying to make up your mind. Your folks are sleeping. Let's not waste any time Oh, I know it's late But I can't wait Come on and steal away I know it's wrong Asking this of you There's no other way I can be with you Start thinking, trying to make up your mind. Your folks are sleeping, let's not waste any time. Oh, I know it's late, but I can't wait. Come on and steal away. That's how love used to be in the start. At least it was for me as the years go by. You wake up in the morning and she rolls over and says, you still here? And like she expected me to go somewhere in the night, I guess. It's just a joke. I've got to see you somehow. Not tomorrow, but right now. Oh, I know it's late, but I can't wait. Come on and steal away, steal away. Steal away, baby. Thank you, thank you. You guys are still newlyweds, so you don't have that problem where it's tapered off, you know, but inevitably. It does, believe me. <laughs> you know, the Maybe camera's I, on. The camera's on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah well, well. Real or exaggerated, it's purely coincidental. <laughs> I'm just being a realist tonight, I guess. <laughs> we'll do a couple Christmas songs here, and then I'll pass it on to whoever is next. <laughs> Only do these once a year, so... It takes a while to get the, uh... It's coming around now. Christmas, Christmas time is near. It is. The time for toys is the time for cheer. Last James, hurry Christmas. 
Christmas Hurry fast I want a plane That loops the loop Sister wants A hula hoop Yeah We can hardly Stand the way So Christmas Don't be late No, there's no Alvin in this Got rid of him updated this song. I've done this before. Jenny knows. I brought it into the 21st century, at least. Sarah wants Nintendo Wing. A GPS will be fine for me. Michael wants a flat screen TV. For Mama, a laptop under the tree. We can hardly stand the way, so Christmas, don't be late. Christmas, Christmas time is near, the time for toys, and it's the time for cheer. We've been good, but we can't last. Hurry Christmas, hurry fast. Thank you, thank you. I always tell my granddaughter, uh, put the capo on so that the guitar doesn't rattle and then I don't follow my own advice, but song made Ross back this area in a million years. I'm sure it did, yeah. I mean, I listened to it for, you know, 50, 60 years of my life and got so sick of the chipmunks, I just decided to relieve the song of the chipmunks and I, I wound up liking the song, so not a bad song. I'm sure the children would prefer to have the chipmunk version, but when they reach, uh, <laughs> no, maybe not. Speed up the well, voice. Yeah. When you record it. <laughs> That's all you got to do. Put it on 78, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Got one more for you. This is a song that gets a lot of airplay. And uh, man, I changed the key and then I didn't write down what the key was, but we'll just we'll just guess at it. I think it was possibly up here. The key of D. The song was written by John Lennon, and you will hear this on the radio. If you haven't heard it this week, that would be very unusual if you haven't heard it on one of the radio stations. Uh, John Lennon was a peace-loving man, a pacifist, from all uh, that I knew about him as far as what I had read and seen. And uh, for being so, he got shot down on the streets of New York City in cold blood for actually no reason. Such is life.
so this is Christmas for weak and for strong the rich and the poor ones the road is so long and so happy Christmas for black and for white for the yellow and red ones let's stop all the fight Go ahead, James. James sounds on these instruments. I should have had them on there sooner, I guess. So, yes, up next, beginning our series of the Dark and Dystopian, we have Third Isaac. I'm looking for a different crowd. Next uh, month, I'm going to be performing at the Flint Local, and that's, uh, I don't know where it is. Cody knows the address. First, but it's on First Street. Yeah, I'm going to be performing there on the same date as today, but next month. And uh, I should have my mixtapes done by then. January 21st, then? Uh, yeah. Um, I think you died. <laughs> Jacking with the bullet holes, traffic in the coolest flows. Did you turn it up? Little wishes from the wall. Staring at the curse mark. The world ends when the trip starts. Grabbing in the building. Tap dancing on the edge of a building. Splattered on the sidewalk. Suicide walk. Yeah, that was a nice talk. They looking for answers, I'm just looking for cancers. Smoke a cigarette, then I go dance with the phantoms. Shrines and castles, virgin birth, invite the jackals, virgin search of lifeless mammals. Smoking opium as the darkness closes in. Ghosts to sin, closest friend, starts the show again. No time to explain. All I know is they're coming for you. Sorry, I know my music is dark. I'm not really an <laughs> asshole-ish person. I'm actually a nice person. Let's go. I'm just antisocial and weird around people. And I also could be a serial killer. <laughs> but if I was, I'd do it for the right cause, like Dexter, and kill people like myself. This is a sample from an old horror movie. The lady asks him, do you hear the dead people talking? He's like, dead people don't talk. He's like, 
she was she was tries to get with him and shit. He's like, I'll break your neck like a fucking pause. <laughs> he was just this nigga is a psychopath, bro. I don't know, he's just weird. But uh Um, I think you died. Um, I'm looking for a different one. Oh, oh, nah, I can't do this. I'll do this one. <laughs> this is explicit, but I'm gonna just say it. You said they're used to their mother. They should know about everything I'm about to talk about. Can you just turn it up? It's not that bad. It's just got some stuff about God in it. Please? That's Christmas ever. I didn't do that. Your phone button. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Frying like worms on the sidewalk Living proof God's asshole is human shape Walking up to the church with a can of gas Run away from home and join the sideshow Nigga, nigga, nigga Sound like you murder me Open head surgery It's not that big of an emergency Even though my brain's full of curse words And worse Worst things Profanity raised this first thing Humanity commanded to obey Ten times the size of a normal brain About to explode with bulging veins so somebody stuck a needle through it and it started leaking fluid. People knew it was the evil doers. Peekaboo, who you think that you were speaking to? Living in a white man's world, got some light skinned girls that'll set your ass on fire, call them light skinned girls. When I set your brain, you got your tongue stuck out just like dead squirrels. Lungs crying like worms on the sidewalk. Living proof, God's asshole is human shape. Walking up to the church with a can of gas. Run away from home and join the sideshow. Nigga, nigga. Nigga, sound like a broken record, but I'm breaking records. A bowl of serial killers is what I ate for breakfast. If I catch another body with this chainsaw, I'm headed off to Texas. No place like homicide. Who wanna die? I'm sorry, I forget this song, but I'm still in diet. Hand me the 45. Wearing fake disguise to my own funeral. If I wake up now, it'll be a rumor though. Sell enough crack to pay your student loans. I got two phones, one for my friends and one that they Walking up to the church with a can of gas Run away from home and join the sideshow Nigga, nigga, I'm kinda nervous and shit I don't get lots of hugs, buying box of guns Psychotropic drugs, shooting cops is fun You should probably run But you can't cause you smoke so you hacking up a lung You thought I'd do more but actually I was done Vomit stomach acid like I had something nasty on my tongue How repulsive and blasphemous I become human worm The last of demented sons with an army of scientists and lab coats in the skulls of the average Joes with rusty contraptions. Genius, I suppose. Using massive holes to suck your brain out through your nose. Snatch the stem from the spine and watch your corpse dance around like, like Frankenstein, Frankenstein while it's dying. dying. Uh, this next one, I probably know better. This one's called Old Boy is Talking Corpse. It's my. Second favorite, no, third. Oh, A hundred million flies in my face. Got another dead body on the streets. With a rope around my neck, still kicking my feet. Walking like a freaking creep, but I ain't got no friends, just a geek. Glasses with a broken lens, still trying to peek. Eyeball hanging from the socket, got another in my pocket. They love how I rock it. Flow dead, brain dead. I stay a fed, and the bitches stay freshly murdered in my bed. Liquor shots too many, take one to the head. I love a fucking knife, but I might use a gun instead. Pull the fucking trigger on that bitch and paint the walls red. What's that? Hey, happy holidays, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Deck the walls. Um, shit. I don't know how that happened. Um, I'ma just turn around and see them with they thumbs up. But I'm from the greedy slums where they feed us crumbs. Little niggas robbing with they beaming guns. Teenage niggas probably blowing weed for fun. Blowing freestyles. G think I'm the dopest one. Haven't lost a battle since I was just a Padawan. Only 22 and I'm pretty much the avatar. When it comes to rapping, dog, rattle off a lot of topics that you probably never thought of. Stab you talking donkeys in the head with the 
this Jabberwocky bitch back up off me. Got that pick ass to frost it from my heart to get to position. Don't make me get violent. I just wanna stare at naked women having sex in prison with my x ray vision after smoking meth with pigeons sitting at my desk with scissors. Most of the people in that new super hard fever link Overrated skyscraper, futuristic shit Fuck Tyler, the creator It's that friendly neighbor, and he the annihilator Tossing in the calculator, sit back and eat a pack of annihilators I mean he's alright, but I got more style and flavor And I'm on some outer space stuff Yo, 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 yo I got that Ouija flow, walking stiff in this C-3PO, whopping up like Beetlejuice with a crew full of evil dudes. And we got a scheme to make the people groove on the dance floor until they fucking bleed from their shoes. Mama, I'ma end up on the evening news. Charlie Chilton party like I guess they let the demons loose. Troy and Jen and the juice, timid as usual. Black nail polish seep down to my cuticles. Pink on the middle ones, and I'm undead, so I'm moving like I'm 80 some. Man, I'm Shady's cousin. Screws in their necks and antennas in their heads Take your brain as a souvenir Choppers and laser guns What's the fucking difference between a zombie and an alien? Yeah, talking about that ape shit The more I feel dangerous like Sosa Will Chamberlain Back the body up, tell the culture, kill the game again Life is a game, a chance when you fucking hang with him Gamma radiation racing through his veins again You don't want to anger him That's it. Sorry, I'll try to do better uh, next week. I wanted to do some poetry that I have. It's uh, my poetry. I just started writing poetry. It's like my first three poems that I wrote. But there, I'm gonna try and do that next month. Okay, Whatever. Cool. Uh, more, 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 more. All righty. Uh, oh, Ashley is up next, and she shall be serenading us with her tenor ukulele and guitar or just the yeah, okay so guitar okay yeah. so okay now is that one plug in yeah okay so we'll be do you understand uh, no. okay is that feasible that's good okay. thanks hi hi all right this song's called just a friend to you why you gotta hug me like that every time you see me? Why you always making me laugh? I swear you're catching feelings. I loved you from the start. So it breaks my heart when you say I'm just a friend to you. Cause friends don't do the things we do. Everybody knows you love me too. Try and be careful with the words I use I say it cause I'm dying to I'm so much more than just a friend to you When there's other people around You never wanna kiss me You tell me it's too late to hang out But then you say you miss me I loved you from the start my heart when you say I'm just a friend to you cause friends don't do the things we do everybody knows you love me too try and be careful with the words I use I'll say it cause I'm dying to I'm so much more than just a friend to you I'm going to switch to guitar now. We got our own plug down there. Oh, oh. Yeah, okay. I had unplugged it before. Okay. Oh, you're already in there. Yeah. Thank you. 
This one's called Hurricane. Well, there's a place way down in Bed-Stuy Where a boy lives behind bricks He's got an eye for girls of 18 And he turns them out like tricks Well, I went down to a place in Bed-Stuy A little liquor on my lips I let him climb inside my body And held him captive in my Jeans, and now I'm covered in the colors pulled apart at the seams. 
you. Everything is blue, his pills, his hands, his jeans, and now I'm covered in the colors pulled apart at the seams, and it's blue. Sciences Academy represented this evening. A couple of announcements. The Creative Alliance meets every first Wednesday of the month at Churchill's, downtown there, for us out of towners, at 7 p.m. And Collab Night, this, is every third Wednesday right here at the world's greatest institution, the Good Beans Cafe, from 7 to 10. It says May question mark. Is that definite? Oh, the for voice. Oh, the date. The date is not not the, the, the. Well, it's the first Friday in May, and I didn't know what that Friday was when I was writing that. Okay, well, I'm not going to hazard a guess in case I'm wrong. But the first Friday in May of 2016, there will 17. be. A, oh, you're right, but it's written 16. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but but so yes, the first Friday of May in May 2017, as perhaps it was last year, well, it will be voices which is artists, poets, spoken Any, word, anything? Artists of all genres um, can, can be in voices, but what happens is two artists from two different genres are played together like maybe a painter and a poet, and they collaborate on a art. Okay, and, and that will be right here at Good Beans. Artists seeking partners, please contact the Creative Alliance. Willie McCraw. William McCraw yep, of the Creative Alliance. Yep, you can find him on Facebook, and then you can also put it on the Voices Facebook page. Okay, so look for William McCraw's Facebook page, Voices Facebook page. The art will hang at Good Beans for two months. Fabulous. And now... And it goes into a book, too. Oh, it goes into a book, too. Yeah. Also fabulous. And now, poet, novelist, and dapperly handsome man, <laughs> we have Mr. Jeff Carey. That to your taste. That should be good. Here okay. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you to our illustrious host. And I'd like to thank Ken for inviting me out tonight, too. Um, I do have four books of poetry that I've published, uh, but this is my first novel. Uh, so I'm going to read just a short excerpt from the novel. Uh, I do have some of my books here, too, if, if anyone would like to purchase them. But, um, How much are they? Uh, they are $10 each. Only, Only $10. ten dollars. Only ten dollars. Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna hold the book up and I'll, I'll zoom in on it, like the, so the oh, cover is yes. facing me. The uh, the name of the novel is the Reflection of Elias Dumont. Here, keep, it's keep, a it's a it. historical it. fiction. Put it back up there for a minute. A horror story. Um, some of my influences early on were Stephen King, you know, Anne Rice, um, but it was more heavily influenced actually by my poetry. Um, and I, I tried to work a lot of that into it, a lot of, um, especially what I was studying during my master's program. Um, but um, here's the excerpt. Oh, I wanted to put out also, uh, Friday the 13th, uh, Ken is going to host me here from four to eight o'clock and I will be signing books. So um, if you want to come out then. Um, January? January? Uh, yes, January, Friday the uh, 13th. January, Friday. That's, that's Art Walk night, too. Oh. What time is your thing? From 4 to 8. Oh, cool. Yours is just before Art Walks. People could go to your thing and then go to Art Walk. That day better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A um, little background, too. Um, the character is immortal because uh, 
he acquired a mirror, a small hand mirror, it's called a catoptron. Um, uh, it is a historical fiction also because uh, um, in the early 1800s, there was a, a flood called the Madrid uh, earthquakes and it caused the Mississippi River to flow backwards. Um, I kind of tied the story into that um, phenomenon that happened. Uh, and what happened is the mirror uh, possesses the holder. It gives them immortality, but it also drives them pretty well insane. Uh, and they try to keep the mirror secret, of course, so nobody else gets the immortality. Okay. Um, so this is chapter, the beginning of chapter four. Outside the hotel, Elias stepped onto the sidewalk and inhaled the evening air. Its scent was rich with the dank moisture, a moisture that steadily filled in the city around him. He walked for a time with his hands in his pockets until he reached the base of the arch, and then he stood looking up at it. The metallic structure towered above him in its beautifully useless way. Streaks of silver light broke across its plated surface like bands of lightning. The whole structure seemed to capture the city and then distort it. He took the air in again as a breeze carried the smell of the Mississippi River to him. It caused him to shudder. The swollen river's banks had nearly reached the base of the arch, and as he looked out and across, he pulled his hand from his pocket and felt the handle of the looking glass beneath his shirt. Part of him wanted to fling it into the river, to cast it away, but he knew the futility of this too well. It was certainly not the answer, and he understood that better than anyone. His hand trembled as he pulled it away and tucked it back into the pocket of his pants. He looked again at the water, at the lights of the city muted in its pungent darkness, and then he turned and walked to the road and hailed a cab. A red Laclede cab stopped, and then he opened the door and slid in. I need to go to a liquor store. Any particular one, the cabbie said, glancing back at Elias in the rearview mirror. Doesn't matter, but after I stop there, I'd like to go somewhere to get a drink. The cabbie nodded as he depressed the meter and then accelerated into the sparse traffic. You from around here? It's been a while, but yes. You don't look like the club type. No, is Jane A still around? Sure. That'll be fine. The man nodded again and made a turn onto Olive Street and headed west until he reached a party store, then stopped. He waited with the meter running until Elias came back out and then he drove on again past St. Louis University and onto Lindell Boulevard until they reached the central west end. Elias sat staring out the window, the lights and the buildings passing as he tapped the pack of cigarettes on his knee. You've been gone a long time then? The cabbie asked, but it was rhetorical. Something to break the sound of the tapping, perhaps. Does it matter? No, the man said, scratching the stubble of his face. Just trying to make conversation is all. The cab slowed, and then they made a left turn onto Newstead and drove a few blocks until they reached the old brick building that stood on the left side of the avenue. Elias pulled a money clip from his pocket as the cabbie slowed and stopped along the west side of the avenue, turning his body slightly as his elbow rested on the back of the bench seat. Pulling several bills from the money clip, Elias handed the man his money and told him to keep it. The cabbie thanked him as Elias opened the door and stepped out onto Newstead Avenue and shut the door, and then he walked across the avenue, stopping beneath the streetlight for a moment as the cab pulled away. He looked around, lingering, resting against the black iron pole of the artificial light exposed him like a lighthouse above some foreboding shore where shallow jagged rocks lie hidden below deceptively tranquil waters. He was patient as he stood lingering, calculated, and after a few minutes passed, he glanced up at the small sign that jutted out from the brick just above the shingled awning. And then Elias opened the pack of cigarettes and threw the foil on the ground and popped out one of the pack, placing it in his mouth and lighting it. As he opened the squeaky door, he stepped into the dim neon light and let the door slam behind him. 
There were more people in the place than he thought there would be, but that wasn't saying much. And after quickly scanning the bar, he moved towards a corner seat where he could face the door. The bartender nodded at him as he passed, and Elias returned the nod and blew the smoke from his mouth as a waitress approached, greeting him as, she, as he sat down. He slid the ashtray closer to him and tapped his cigarette on it. What'll you have, hon? He smiled at her and tapped his cigarette again, a fifth of bourbon and a glass of ice. Tough day at the office then, she said, with one hand on her hip and the other pressed against the table. Something like that. Well, you ain't planning on driving home tonight, are you? No, ma'am. Good, she said, turning and strutting towards the bar. He leaned back in the seat and smoked and watched the door, and as the waitress came with the bourbon and the glass, he saw the door open and close. In the doorway stood the silhouette of a woman, as if the shadow of something beautiful had entered and paused, but it was no shadow. It caused the bartender to look twice. She stood motionless for a moment, some fragments of light still filing in behind her, loosened stragglers, enough to keep the faint aura around her figure until she eased forward. Let me know if there's anything else you need, hun, the waitress said, as Elias poured the bourbon in the glass. Thank you, I will. He swirled the ice and the bourbon in the glass, keeping his eyes focused narrowly on the woman who seemed to move like liquid through the yellowish light and dense smoke. She seemed the only thing in the room that could truly move freely, uninhibited by the elements of the room, the tables, the chairs, all fixed in their places. Even the dim Xanthos light over the bar appeared trapped as if a hundred years of thick smoke and had somehow slowly dried it into a jerky-like substance. Its particles condensed and the light suspended in time. Yes, suspended in time, he thought, as he made a final swirl with the glass and shot the brown fluid down his throat. The cold bourbon had a better sting, and as he sat the glass back on the table, he placed the cigarette into his mouth. Then he pushed the chair beside him out with his boot, looking up as he raked the hair from his face. In front of him stood the woman. She had her arms crossed and her head tilted slightly to the side, and as she stood there, her long brown hair delicately coiled and fell around her bare shoulders. Elias marveled at her as she glared at him, her green eyes glinting slivers of silver. Sit down, Echo, he said, as his eyes flowed along the curves of her blood red dress. Why did you come back, Elias? Is that any way to speak to an old friend? Sit down. With some reluctance, she scooted the chair in and sat down beside him. She let her arm press against his arm, and then he placed his hand on her hand and felt her cool olive skin. With her free hand, she took the cigarette from his mouth and leaned in and kissed him. And as she pulled away, the smoke lingered between their lips, and then she placed the cigarette in her mouth. You're still trying to kill yourself, she said, and I'm still trying to live. His eyes said what his lips failed to say. He just smiled as his eyes filled with pain, like two pools of terrible anguish that were trapped in this facade, two pools of turquoise suspended in time. He may have wept had the waitress not shuffled up to their table. That's a gorgeous dress, the waitress said. What'll you have? Thank you. Echo said softly, her eyes remaining fixed on Elias. What's your name, Elias asked. Jamie, he said, his face softening. Thank you, Jamie. Could you just bring us another glass of ice? Sure thing, hon. He took another cigarette from the pack and lit it, and as the waitress went to the bar and leaned over the counter to grab a glass, filling it with a scoop of ice, in a moment she had returned smiling setting the glass on a napkin. They exchanged smiles as she quickly slid the glass in front of Echo, and then she started across the room to another table. Elias watched her. He noticed how she seemed to walk with purpose, so much more animated than Echo or he. 
so much more alive. Can we find your book on Amazon? Yeah, the book is on Amazon, uh, BarnesandNoble.com. It's on the Black Madonna Press website. Uh, you can get it on Lulu. Um, Publish thing. You can, Black, Black Madonna, isn't it? The Black Madonna Press. No, but uh, the, the 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 after whom it's named. Isn't that a, oh, the Black Madonna is it actually was my wife's Shastoska? grandfather's. <laughs> Prize-winning Arabian horse. Oh, okay. oh. well then they're both named after. Okay. Yeah, he passed away, and I dedicated the press. To oh, okay. Him. Cool. Okay. All righty. It is on sale at Totem Books, also. Oh, cool. Thank you. Once more for Mr. Jeff Carey here. Yeah. Are you at time tonight, James? I am your next performer. All right, man. Cool. Yes. So we shall see how this goes. This is an alto clarinet. Uh, those of you who played in high school, junior high, whatever, middle school bands may have seen parts for this. He says E flat alto sax slash E flat alto clarinet. Uh, but the instrument itself is a rather an obscurity. So, um, let's see how it, oh, geez, how it works tonight. Depth perception, yes. Okay, so we'll start with this and then I'll, you know, I'll read something. So. <laughs> Quite an imaginary pile 
of unfinished novels. So I thought, hmm, what if I put them all into one and made a meta novel? Hmm? So I would approach it in the spirit of Central European modernism. Mm -hmm. So it would be a polyphonic text in which there are embedded various nuggets of things I never finished. And the meditations upon why I never finish anything. So, and then we have questions of identity and all that flows from it. And, you know, uh, the phrase was used in uh, Vladimir Nabokov's novel, Invitation to a Beheading, Gnostical Turpitude. It is described in the old vintage edition blurb as an imaginary crime which defies definition. This is not true. It has a very precise definition and it's in the book. It is the crime of being more real than your surroundings. You are at one less remove from the pleroma, the reality, the Godhead, than the sordid and obviously illusory material world. So with all that as background, don't you realize how much you are other people? All identity is political because whoever you may be, annoyed by the piano player in the next room, you're already a polis. Polis, a regular room full of blues and reds. If unlikely to be born in or of or into the purple. So whose identity is proper and whose identity can properly be identified? Politics, politics all. I'll tell you what I don't need, and what I don't need is your weenus envy. Contramundum? I'll settle for contrafandom. Whoever all these other people are that you are, however much, in spite of everything, even before Elijah was, I am, comparatively. And that's incidentally the definition of Gnostical turpitude. In spite of everything, I am, comma, comparatively. You see, need you identify with them? The others, ooh, the others, ooh, just like you. This is my novel and it will not be new. It will be unpublishable because of all the identifiable properties embedded within. Consider this a harbinger of when you, when some outsourced billing department sends you a threatening bill with a law firm's name attached demanding you pay up for your theft of property rightfully belonging to a biotech concern in Bellevue, Washington. <laughs> this property being your genetic endowment and all the protein proteins attendant thereupon, you will owe royalties on yourself, your body, you. You will be guilty through the property of identity of Gnostical turpitude. Don't say you weren't warned. What, at this late hour? Were we not spared the British purveyors of pop tones who narcissistically echoed Joyce? Jesus Jones claimed to be right here, right now, watching the world wake up from history. We all shared initials, JJ, Jesus Jones. Jones implied, and James Joyce, what Joyce's reflection, the artificer of labyrinths, Pliny 28.7, stated that history is, was a nightmare. One lump or two? An emotional fish, a British believe, I only believe, only in their choice of native archipelago. This was a obscure Irish uh, alternative band from 1992. Uh, native archipelago from the same Emerald Isle as Joyce and his Daedalus, but Joyce was, after all, born British, told us that history was an insanity intruding on the sane. So much question begging there. But they all really did, all they really did, was put the same kind of nonsense into pop tones instead of into neoconservative glosses, as France, glossies rather, as Francis Fukuyama, the end of history. Bosh, don't say you weren't warned. In the 90s when the world was young, every other craptacular purveyor of broad spectrum alternative pop tones had Jesus in their name. This was one of those things mistaken for irony, which Robert Plant had purported to pump in the waning days of the second Reagan administration. History was ending, which gave virtually everyone an excuse not to learn any of it. Everyone would become, after the next quarter century, during which right here, right now, grew old enough to get its car insurance rates lowered and change target demographics. Virtually everyone, where right here, 
where right where, where, where right here was ceased to matter, while right now became all anyone would want to mind. People came to want to identify with now and with the future. It is murder. Do, do, do. At the same time, so many of them wish to identify as conservatives. Cause after all, what did the past matter? We won, USA, USA. All that mattered was that history had a right side and that we were either on it or more simply it. Our triumphalists had told us, if only they'd used Howard Cosell to broadcast it, that it's over, it's all over. Not that one. <laughs> Pardon me here. Ah, yes, okay. So how shall I explain to you, gentle reader, what I mean by my pseudo and supra, supra Freudianism, weenus envy? Surely you grasp your weenus with those social lubricants that help you get off. <laughs> your sense of identity beyond and before the I, a belonging, an inclusion, as well as an exclusion, safely at home in the suburbs, behind that electric fence where you graze, as your fleeced, maybe, perhaps deliberate, largely unconscious or pre-conscious, how you relate your capital I to the agora, the market, the idea, the index of we. Get out your catechisms, people. Let me explain the other word. Jealousy is not envy. Jealousy is clinging over much, feeling possessive of what one owns, thinks one owns, ought not own. A lack of trust, a failure of faith, or rather, failing one's faith. And Thelonious and Polyphony, please, for the love of God, stop crinkling that paper or whatever you're doing. Would-be theological quibblers take note. The divine jealousy is rather like an Aristotelian propriety. It is not of the same stuff as the deadly sin. Envy is the wish to deny something to another. Mozart doesn't deserve his genius because he's such a vulgar, ill-mannered ass. That's envy. <laughs> The colloquialism is milder. If Adrian envies Sidney, his weenus, he doesn't wish that Sidney lose all of his embeddings in family, in place, in Polishness. He simply wishes he were not himself. So solitary and castaway. Political weenus envy is more deadly sinful. The angry atheist wants all the churches torn down, both for the believers failing to conform to the weenus of the angry atheist and for the believers' own ecclesia their own sense of distinction as a group, their own weenus, which our angry atheist wants to see smashed and burnt to gloat over the ruins. <laughs> the angry atheist is big on iconoclasm. What she doesn't see is that the idols she constructs, the imperial genius to which she pinches incense. So what then of physics envy? The desire to numerate and thereby reify? Is this the desire, the lust of the bright and creative to rob the yokel, the bumpkin, the trumpkin, the backward, the dead-ender, the clinger to guns and religion of everything to leave him all to the landfills of his landscapes like Job on his dunghill? Eh, could be. <laughs> all right, one more little bit here. Uh, where did that go? James, are you like reading backwards in the book? I'm left-handed, so I write oh, from I the right to the left, down. yes. Yes, um, I, I would have made an excellent Semite in that in that regard, writing writing that way. Except that they don't let you do that. That's ritually impure, so they don't want you to do that. Um, so, yes, Japanese comics are gone. Yes, exactly. The stray physicist, particularly if he be a salesman, Hawking, is our priestly oracle. And the social psychologist, Jonathan Haidt, wishes to occupy this critical position to have the brights and creatives hang on his every word. And I, for one and for all, do not care whether they hang together or separately. So he divines numbers and makes of them their artifact. Thus, Gilbert and Sullivan were right all along, you see. One is, this is science, mind you, either liberal or conservative. It's, and this is hard science, genetic. We are not, in fact, free to be you and me. What? 70s educational films lied to us? Unless, as it happens, we are fated to be by good reductionist, properly scientific molecules. The sort of identity that could be proprietary, all still under the last dust. A broom is drearily sweeping. But look, see? 
The proponents and exponents of scientism, all hateful and hawking their wares, how they wear on me. Shall I go naked into the dark? They proclaim the essential nature of our weenus. We are metro or we are retro. Both are actually suburbanites. We are brights and creatives or we are darkly destructive. We are makers or we are takers. We are our weirdness by right, by prescription. Is this the god behind the mask of our idle pluralism? We are plural. You, y'all, the National Association for the Advancement of You People, as Rothboro once said in 1992, are plural. They are plural. Diversity is our greatest strength unless it be the diversity of our opinion about diversity. And what about the bad old Dr. Freud? Woody Allen joked of old that he was one of the very few males who suffered from penis envy. Some Freudian, that you Andy, will have to check his concordance for the original term. This is a character named Andy Freude. So what I'm doing now. Don't be snide. As is snide, because penis envy in German is der penis snide. The male with penis envy holds his own with a grudge. Adrian, who was a youth and a Woody Allen fan, considered psychology as a career, had read and been taught that penis envy had been supposed to be, in those bad old days of masculine normativity, the girl's wish that she had a penis, anatomically, not as her scepter of another's passion. Penis nide was to have been of the same order as Adrian's wish to have had a loving, supportive family, like Sidney, like Molly, like some others. But Sidney, our reverend popish philosopher, theologian, explained to him over late night French dips and milkshakes, coffee and cigarettes, that envy the deadly sin would make penis nide the dangerous supplement of the topology of castration complex. The female wishes the male not to have a penis. So many fewer stained sheets, socks, undergarments, mattresses, such lower household expenditures on Vaseline, Crisco, lard. Is there a worse case of science identifying with the interior landscape of such a sick motherfucker? Still, if household means dick grudge, maybe he should have it out with DC. You unfortunate souls, I won't identify with you, who sulked and sludged through Freud and the Freudians and the Frankfurters, <laughs> the Lacans and the Derridas, you know the whole deconstructed bit of fellow logocentricity. The cock is a presence, the cunt is an absence, but it's the thing there that is driven by desire, lack, for the yawning gap of what isn't. Crazy! The one who is not there, thus beyond the zero, is the one who gives commands, like Rilke's washed corpse. Putting the nekos in the naked. Shiva Shava needs a Burma shave. The presence wishes to empty itself, into the absence. So Eros craves Thanatos, or secretly, the two mask the same identity. But I am assured it's different for girls. Doland wishes to die with to die with thee again in sweeter sympathy. But then complains as he, like Mark Arm, keeps asking his paramour to come again, that he instead dies in deadly pain and deepest misery. Almost done. <laughs> when cornered, the human beast looks for a weenus to help and a thinus to cast out. I'm not like you. I'm X. You're just like Y. These are reasonable weapons and reliable weapons in our arsenal of desperation. I would we you or they you as in a mirror. I might myself. I might I myself. Here, let us include the plastic nature of atoms and the atoms of plastic nature. The weenus of all those googling eyes, all ionized and weakly bonding, seeking that sweet and elusive fruit. Can't read my own writing. Can't, that sweet and elusive fruit, <laughs> condolence, consilience, something that rhymes with orange. Thank you all very much. And das Stürzer Gott aus seinem Hinterhalt. <laughs> And now a man who's much, much, much more handsome than I, Mr. Christian Pankovic. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be playing a show. Okay, what, say that again. What day is it going to be again? Friday, January 6th, 7.30, here, this room, this stage. At the Good Beans Cafe. At the Good Beans Cafe. Please come. Oh, who is, what, you're, you're in a band? Is that what yes. you're saying? Yes. 
What's the name of the band? The band is called Shapeshifter on SoundCloud with an underscore, shape underscore shifter. Okay. And you play the guitar, I suppose. I do, and I sing. Oh, cool. cool. Yeah. Hopefully good. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the plan. Always. Thank you so much. All right, uh, this is gonna be, this is a song uh, that I've had written for a while, but never had any words. I'm not gonna play this on January 6th, so I'm gonna play it right now. Good. Before, but I really like it, uh, so I'm gonna play it again. This one's called Blue Jay. Blowing smoke, got sand from Equinox, a diver's suit supply.
7.30 p.m. here. Show up. Woo! Woo! Hi, uh, uh, Good Beans collab night. We have uh, an honored guest, and he is none other than Beelzebub himself. And he has come to us in the form of a certain Justin Scanlon, who will now perform, or shortly, will perform for us once he has mastered the niceties of his tone. Ooh, he's being flanged. All right. So, any other further announcements? So, everyone's going to come on the 6th of January to see Christian. Yes, of course. Yes, woo. Yes. And and we'll have you all have to say woo. Yes. And then the following week, you will see Mr. Carey, Jeff, right? And and you will come get copies of his book and buy them and he will sign for them you and he will be equally both of these gentlemen will be equally devastatingly handsome. So, <laughs> Yes. So, are we quite set, uh, your, your infernal darkness? Okay. Beelzebub, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, this one. Thank you. I was supposed to play with somebody today, so I brought my electric guitar rig. And now all of a sudden I'm saying to myself, hey, what, what song am I going to sing here? You know, it's like, hey, everybody's got their spoken word stuff going on, and all I got is a bunch of fingers and strings there. <laughs> dropped his wallet and all the time we spent cannot be saved I think it's time to go take a twilight walk among my idols and dig my heart a little grave but then the new moon comes down and kisses me fresh from a cradle in the sky perfect new moon and kisses me, bathes me in the shadows. The room I'm sitting in crowds me. Memories of you flow through my mind. I reach and I want to touch you, baby, but imaginary hands and a distant mirror, it's all I find. But then a new moon comes down and kisses me, fresh from a cradle in the sky. A perfect new moon, she comes and she kisses me, bathes me in the shadow. into my ashtray leaving gray not silver stains and that seem to rain in acid whispers and X our hearts with pain but then the new moon comes down and kisses us fresh from a cradle in the sky yeah a perfect new moon she comes and kisses Bays you in the shadows. A new moon comes right down and kisses us. Fresh from a cradle in the sky. A perfect new moon comes right down and kisses us. Bays me in the shadows. Thank you. 
If you've ever felt the point where suicide was for optimists, this song is for you. Chessboard calls the peeps his people, a sacrifice is made. The power to the clever call the clever vicious. <laughs> They've come to stay. And they're feeling very bored, they're feeling restless to the core. They're looking for something, just look in. And the mannequins and satin walk along the sidewalks, whispering at windows. The shops are all deserted, the sleazy bars are closing, the emptiness just grows. <laughs> postcards from the place nobody sends postcards from. <laughs> well, we can be warm and we can be fuzzy too. Especially like red hot brillo pads. <laughs> Take me 
to the harvest. Take me to the harvest. Take me to the harvest. Waking, drinking, and the normal thinking, and the weary eyes that are bloodshot blinking. They're always gonna looking at the withered skies each morning. Spit a thousand fucking lies. Greed arrives entangling needs, desires, and regrets. The watchers line the streets and bet on tricks. Perform without a net. There are clowns in the smiles. There are canyons for miles. There are clouds and smiles. And canyons for miles. Canyons for miles. I'm not sure. I haven't checked with the bloodhounds. Well, Wednesday nights at the Golden Leaf is amateur night, and it's always lots of fun. The Golden Leaf? The Golden oh, yeah, Leaf. Man. Is that as in the, 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 the onion-like plant? <laughs> Golden. Golden Leaf. Golden Leaf. Golden, no, Leaf. Oh, Golden <laughs> <laughs> well, That doesn't have anything to do with those. Inflam Golden Leaf. leaf. Yes. Yeah. All right then. Yeah, I'm like Victoria. That's right. It's it's a, it's a pure, it's a pure tobacco. Yes. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, and once more for Justin, shall we? Yeah. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, we have another handsome devil who has been voted the seven-time winner of the most likely to look like Lowell George contest. This is. Anthony, is it? Yeah, Rob. Mr. Rob Anthony. Yes. Double B. Don't call Woo! him Mark. <laughs> How's everybody doing this evening? Good. You guys, uh, I'll get all your holiday action done. So you got the right word? Well, I mean, I don't work at a store anymore, so I don't know how it is out, outside in the outside world. Because I just work from home, and uh, dude, I tell you, it's a nightmare. I tried to go out the other day, and I, I just almost had a panic attack driving. I don't remember where I was going. I think I was meeting my parents over at Buffalo, ye old Buffalo Wild Wings. And, uh, God, it was terrifying. Really, it was, it was just truly nightmarish. I don't know, man. Maybe it's just me. Uh, two days ago? Yeah, that, it was, uh, that was the day. What day? Because, yeah, today's Wednesday. It was Monday, yeah, because I was like, this is a weekday. Why is there, why does nobody have anything better to do? Three people tried to kill me at the parking lot of the Jesse Vaughn in the, in the yeah. car. Yeah, oh, yeah. They just, they just... Ah! He gets it. Yeah. Yeah, like, I saw the show. Just the regular trying to kill you day. This is the holiday themed killings. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess I'll uh, I'll play a cover for you guys first, and then uh, get warmed up, and then I'll just play a couple originals or something. You don't even reckon 
take it over, ever take it over from you. Thank you all for participating. Collaboration. Yeah, yeah, there you go, there you go. Collaboration. That was a, a song by Man Man. They're a lot more eclectic and, uh, and stranger sounding than that in real life, but you know, definitely check them out. They're from Philadelphia. They're a very uh, strange band. I would suggest like Tom Waits meets Frank Zappa, but like more indie. So it's a, it's a good combination of strange noises. Uh, this will be an original. This one is called Circus Song. Everybody gather around There's a new attraction here in town Tell your friends, neighbors too That the ringmaster's about to sing Let 
child. You'll scream and shout, but you're not for the singing, participating, and we have one more young poet for you, ladies and gentlemen. Last minute sign up. <laughs> Freshly composed poem, Mr. Thelonious Sphere Blum. Okay, and uh, it's called Fake Hospital. Welcome and come well. This is the fake hospital. This is where we fake records. This is where we make our own diseases. If you come um, for surgery, we'll kick you out to the dumpster. If you come, if struggle picks you, then we'll give you our medicine. <laughs> if you come, um, come unwillingly, you'll keep coming on back. If you who need a friend or a reaper, give us a call. You'll find it all. Come on down to our hospital. We stay on the ball. We have it all. <laughs> yeah. So thus concludes another collab night Yay. at Good Beans Cafe. To remind you all, Come see Christian here, 7.30. January 6th. January 6th, 2017. January 13th, come, buy, see, and buy. Mr. Carey, Jeff Carey, yes. Um, someday I'll remember. As he uh, purports and purveys his, his literature, and that is from four to eight? From four to eight, and there will be a, if you buy a book, you'll get a dollar towards your next purchase here at the Good Bean Cafe. Ooh, yeah. if you buy a book, and you must, you will get a dollar towards your next purchase here at the Good Beans Cafe, which you must. And then May, first Friday, you have voices, also here at said Good Beans Cafe. Yeah. That same night, this, is it the 8th? The 13th is the, the, the Art Walk. Is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, in January 13th. January 13th is, is the, the Art Walk. walk. And... Friday. Uh, don't, look, don't forget to look for Rob's non-existent 
album on non-existent records. I, I, am, I am going to be waiting at the non-existent store to buy it with my non-existent money. And any leeway? No, good job hosting. Oh, well, and, uh, bless you. <laughs> yes, yes. Indeed I have, and my bohemian jeans are about to fall off. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. It's been fabulous. Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a good night. <laughs>